These programs this afternoon, these will be the last ones here at the Black History Museum for this month. We'll be doing um, some throughout um, the rest of the year and through the summer. And by um, the end of this year, we will be in our new location over at the Armory Building. And if any of you have had a chance to go past it, I mean, it's come along really, really well. They broke ground on September 2nd, and we are on track. Even with all the, the weather that we've had, um, we're still on track to be completed and be in there. And um, programs like this will let you know that we're here, we're still doing things, and what's going on here will be even more exciting in our new location when we open up. Now, um, and I'm a little bit disoriented here because I did forget a piece of paper, but I uh, wanted to tell you a little about Mr. Alexander Tucker and um, the talks that will be here this afternoon. Now, I'll tell you a little bit about Mr. Tucker. And then I'm going to lead a little bit into Mr. Tucker's son, who will be um, leading the presentation. But the person behind a lot of this research is Mr. Tucker Sr. here. Um, Alexander Samuel Tucker was born in Newport News. And his parents were Mary Elizabeth and Alexander Samuel Tucker. And he attended um, Huntington High School in Newport News in, in 1956 got married in 1957 to Dorothy Virginia Sinclair, and they had three wonderful children, Wanda Verandal, yes, and Vincent, who is here also. Um, anyway, throughout the years, he organized, um, with the support of his siblings, Tucker Enterprises, a family business, and purchased a cleaners and laundry in Norfolk, Virginia. He expanded to about 117 employees in 16 locations. And he also had another daughter. He was selected businessman of the year in, eight, in 1950, excuse me, 1986 by the Tidewater Chamber of Commerce and the Tidewater Area Business Contractors Association. He's been active in many social and civic organizations and he was baptized in Newport News and uh, he began to sing in the church choir until 2002. And he is currently vice president of the William Tucker 1624 Society, which he's going to talk about today. Um, he currently retired, actually, he had a hot dog vending business, Al's Chili Dogs, in downtown Richmond for many years. He retired in 2011. And I guess that's how you guys know each other. Yes, indeed. <laughs> okay. And he currently lives in Petersburg, Virginia. Now, with him today is his son, Vincent Alexander Tucker, and he is the youngest of uh, three sons born to Alexander Samuel Tucker and Dorothy Virginia Sinclair Tucker. And he says that he took, um, he took after his father in many ways. He's strong-willed and stubborn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, he decided that after receiving, I love this, growing tired of the many lashes and yellings, I decided I would graduate from high school a year and a half early, a half year early, so that I could attend Virginia State University. And he said being a Tucker male, not working was an option, and he started working at the age of, of 11. He's cut grass. He finally, um, he finally, where is it? He worked at Tucker's Grocery for his uncle, and then at college, he, I thought that was when, Soon after Tucker Enterprises developed, he went into the dry cleaning business. And you also had the dry cleaning business, yes? The no, boulevard. Yeah. You had a boulevard, and yours was? No. no he worked for me. He worked for you. Okay. Gotcha. I gotcha. He also worked for Food Lion. Um, let me see. I want to kind of fast forward a little bit to now. He has three beautiful children, and he currently owns a moving service called Quality Moving Services. And I might be giving him, he's in Chesterfield, and maybe we'll be giving you a call to help us move when we finally move to, the, to the Army building. To. So, introducing Mr. Tucker and Mr. Tucker. Thank you. Thank you. And in just a minute, there's a third Mr. Tucker that will be walking through the door. He's my brother. <clears throat> he's also an entrepreneur. But we'd like to certainly uh, thank 
Black History Museum and Cultural Center of, of uh, Virginia for inviting us and, and um, allowing us a few moments to share our story, a little history, a uh, little bit about our growing up, and um, we won't talk about the back slaps and all of those whippings. <laughs> That'll be another conversation. Now there's my brother in the back, uh, Verandal Tucker. Hello. Hello. Um, my father asked me, um, as we got in the car, if I did my speaking with you. He's not able to at this moment, so um, if there's any hesitation, you will understand why. But we certainly would like to thank everyone for coming out in this nasty weather. But God is good anyway. In recognition of Black History Month, it is an honor for me or him to share with you genealogy and contributions of the first African American family, William Tucker, 1624. <clears throat> As a descendant of the first recorded African American born in the British colonies, I will present to you information acquired through extensive research and stories told to me by my father, uncles, and other relatives. In March 1997, our father passed away at age uh, 89, two months shy of his 90th birthday. This placed me, him, as the next oldest male child in the family. It was also expected that I would continue with the task of representing the history of the family. August 1994, my family was approached by Jamestown, Yorktown Foundation to participate in the reenactment of the first arrivals of Africans to America. That was a great celebration. The story was reported in the Richmond Times Dispatch, also by CBS News on August 21st, 1994. I, I will attempt to expand on the information that has been reported and hopefully close some gaps. However, I would be remiss if I didn't further share with you the ways our mother and father raised my siblings, three sisters, two brothers, and me. Our parents were devoted Christians who believed strongly in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We were told by our father that his father taught him the Bible. It was mandatory that we attend church on Sundays. And many of you know, it was mandatory. <laughs> if we didn't, we would have to stay in the house all day long. <laughs> Reading the Bible, praying, and reciting Bible verses was taught to us by both parents. We saw a mother pray the most. Cleanliness, we were told, was next to godliness. And that meant not just our bodies, but our home and all of our surroundings. Each of us had to share in the cleansing, cleaning of the house. The yard work was my responsibility because I was a boy, and it was believed that those outside chores were for men. Education was a must. We were instructed to get a good education because it was necessary to be successful in life. Learning poems and reciting, reciting them for company uh, when they came around was no fun, but we had to do it. Choose your friends wisely and treat everyone with respect. Obey the law and don't talk bad about people. This will keep you out of trouble. All of these values, along with others not mentioned, coupled with the support of other family members and friends, helped make us who we are today. We knew for many years the true story, the true history of our African people, and their arrival to America had been ignored, denied, destroyed, and misleading. However, the truth always finds a way to surface. In 1619, they arrived at Port Comfort which today is at Hampton, Virginia. On August 20th, a ship named the White Lion. Aboard that ship was 20 and odd Negroes that came from Angola, Africa. They were captured from the kingdom Indigo during the 1618-1620 Portuguese War against the African kingdoms. Two of the original Africans, Antonio and Isabella, remained in present-day Hampton and became servants on the plantation of Captain William Tucker. The other Africans were transferred to plantations along the James River. They became either indentured servants 
or chattel slaves, depending on who sponsored them. Antonio and Isabella would later give birth to William Tucker, the first African child born in America. They had William baptized in 1924. Yes. I'd like to interject something at this point. I hope you all bear with me. A lot of people don't understand when we say William Tucker was son of Captain William Tucker. Or was he black or was he white? Well, that's because these Africans that came over here, we were given the white man's names. And it so happened that William Tucker was born. Captain William Tucker was so proud, he claimed him as his son. So we would say William Tucker from this point on is African, African, he's black. I, I hope I'm making it clear. Mm -hmm. A lot of people get confused when they you look at me and look at somebody else when they know what's going on. <laughs> Africans were brought to Virginia to provide labor, to plant, and harvest crops. These original Africans came from a civilized society and brought to America. Their skills as farmers growing crops and raising large herds of cattle, goat, and chickens. They were skilled um, artists as blacksmen, blacksmiths, textile weavers, and metal workers. Africans were responsible for various inventions, and some of these <coughs> inventions were inaccurately credited to English immigrants. <clears throat> the Africans are credited with bringing bringing musical instruments from Africa, which led to the creation of the American ban banjo. Family members that began to search for information which would connect our lineage, lineage took two different approaches. One method researched deeds, birth certificates, and death records to trace back family histories or family ties. The other method traced Captain William Tucker's journey. The latter proved to be the most significant. Um, source or the significant one. He set us on a trail that chartered Captain William Tucker to Jamestown in 1610. Later in 1635, Captain William Tucker was given a land grant for 150 acres located in Elizabeth City, Virginia, which is now Hampton, Virginia. That acreage is situated in the Aberdeen section of Hampton, Virginia. It includes two acres grave site, of gravesite, which was called the Old Colored Graveyard. William Tucker, Captain William Tucker, in his will dated October 12, 1642, left all his land in Virginia to William Tucker, whom he called his son. It covers much land that my father often spoke of. This property is that which our family once owned and is the site of the Tucker family's gravesite. The property also includes the Blueberry Gap Farm and the Peninsula Baseball Stadium. In 1886, the gravesite was purchased by Thomas Tucker, along with six other family members and friends, for $100. What a deal. <laughs> As time went on, my father was the oldest male, and he took charge of maintaining the cemetery. When I became of age, he carried me along to help. During those times, Daddy would share plenty of the family history with me. In the family cemetery, I saw grave sites that dated back to the 1700s. That was a scary time. I stepped in an old grave, and I ran off that cemetery. <laughs> I mean, I took, I can't see it. <laughs> Although many of our family members are buried there, other, fam other African American families were given permission to bury their deceased in the same cemetery because they couldn't find affordable, they could not, could not afford any other place during that time. The cemetery, despite having other families buried there, is considered a, ma a major link to the linkage of William Tucker. All of the records we have searched, including phone directories and all the family conversations passed down from generation to generation, have confirmed that no other Tucker family exists in the area until World War II. 
Our desire to know more about our family led us to research Angola and the Portuguese area of Africa. The information we found revealed they were highly intelligent and they developed and mastered many techniques for farming, herding, weaving, tanning, cobbling, and they were skillful traders. Historical records indicate that Portuguese West Africa, alternately named Angola, had an upscale culture. It was ruled by a queen and Christianity was their main religion. Therefore, it stands to reason that Antonio and Isabella were Christians and arrived in America as indentured servants. This also let, lets us understand why William Tucker would be baptized. As a result, when customs were followed, all descendants practicing the religion would be free people. This allowed us to believe our father when he told us no Tuckers have ever been slaves. We were told that most men in the family were merchants, some tailors, blacksmiths, and musicians. One great uncle was a fiddler, and he played for most of the white people, white people's shindig. Our get, uh, great uncle, uh, Collier, owned a laundry in Newport News where whites brought in their laundry for cleaning. He employed several African-American women to, work, uh, to do the work. Later, he moved to Philadelphia and worked in the post office until he retired. He was also very active in the church where he played the violin. Our great uncle Thomas sold produce on the streets of Newport News, and his only son was a pharmacist who established a uh, drugstore partnered with uh, a fellow named Jones. So the business was called Tucker and Jones Pharmacy. Is that in Newport News? That was in Newport News also. Street, Chestnut. Chestnut. On Chestnut Avenue. Chestnut Street. Okay. I work for him. Is that oh. right? Yeah, it's delivering uh, prescriptions. Small world. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is a small world. <laughs> we need to get your name and sure. information before you leave. Thank you. You're welcome. Our grandfather, William, also sold produce on the streets of Newport News until building a grocery store. One of his sons, Emmanuel, kept the store going after our grandfather's death. The store offered a full line of groceries, fresh meats, and produce. The store also sold, the store also sold bag, coal, bundles of wood, and kerosene. Groceries were delivered on the bicycle, <coughs> and later, as the business grew, a van was purchased and used to deliver groceries. My brother and I remember. Oh, yes. <laughs> Many Saturdays delivering groceries. Upstairs over the pool hall. Just happened to be a shot house that we didn't know anything about. I promise you, Dad, we never drank the thing. <laughs> Nothing but Pepsi. <laughs> and they charged us too. Can't keep your hands off. Catering to the needs of the community, the store was forced to offer credit for purchases and this required maintaining charge accounts. My uncle would have a little box with index cards and as Miss Jones or whoever would come in and not have enough, he would jot it down. Uh, some of those, you know, as a business owner, sometimes you have to uh, write off bad debt <laughs> at the end of the year because they don't come back and pay. <clears throat> in order to keep the business afloat, Emmanuel worked nights for, the, for several years at Newport News Shipyard and ran the store during the day. In addition, during World War II, he was an air raid war warden. As time went on, the business grew and required additional help to operate. So in addition to providing jobs to the family members, he also hired the local neighbors. Emmanuel was a progressive business person, and he was constantly updating his store fi fixtures and services. He went on to establish Tucker's Taxi Service. Tucker, as most people called him, had sometimes, a, or they sometimes called him a black Jew, was very <laughs> civic-minded and made cash contributions to almost any worthwhile program. The store was a gathering place for most of the men in the neighborhood. During election time, all of the politicians would stop by and hand out cigars to everyone. Upstairs over the store were two apartments, and this is where Emmanuel and his brother James lived. 
James was a painter, and he also had a dump truck to haul sand, gravel, and dirt. Alexander Tucker Sr., which is my grandfather, followed in his footsteps, father's footsteps, and sold produce on the streets of Newport News as well. He operated with two trucks, and there's a picture up here of one of those trucks. He operated with two trucks, one horse, and a wagon that will pull with a double team. Soon thereafter, he opened a grocery store, which was later converted into a dry cleaners and laundry. Business Ackerman had always been, been with the Tucker men. Each generation followed our great-grandfather, I'm sorry, each generation following our great-grandfather has been filled with successful entrepreneurs. We know our bloodline has roots to Africa because it was substantiated through a DNA test. This test was performed with input from our youngest brother, William Floyd Tucker, taken by a reputable company, African Ancestry. The DNA, however, revealed our relationship to the uh, Akin people of Ghana. We do not know how the passage carried from the Gold Coast to Angola, but we know that Portuguese people ruled the ports of Africa. Captain William Tucker was the commander of Point Comfort, a bursting community in Elizabeth City County. This is, this is the port where many of the indentured servants and slaves were brought and turned over to the plantation owners. For many years, Elizabeth City, Elizabeth City County and surrounding areas had the most productive plantations. This success was attributed to the Africans brought from Angola. As time went on, some of them were given, to, given the chance to complete their servitude and become free. We are certain most of these were given land and, state, and stated claims in the area. Our father, father brought land in Elizabeth City County where he built our family home. He explained to us that it was customary to build a storefront building where you could live and operate a business all in one. He informed us that the front should be built with bricks because that gave an added value and a better appearance. He used the same guidelines as our grandfather. Eventually, the urge came over me, and I organized a family business with my sisters and brothers. The name of that business was Tucker Enterprises. We had purchased a dry cleaner and laundry in Norfolk, Virginia. We operated it for many years, and later my brother Edwin went on and started his own establishment. And um, after his death, my aunt, his sister-in-law, is still running that cleaners today in Norfolk, Virginia. <clears throat> I moved to Petersburg, Virginia, and set up a hot dog vending business in downtown Richmond, Virginia. My two sons, that would be me, and him. <laughs> Trying to bring some humor here. <laughs> are very successful. The oldest, Veranda, owns a successful men's clothing store in Norfolk, Virginia. It's called Details on Grandy. And where he, he um, <clears throat> sells and, and um, custom suits and upscale, it's a very nice upscale store. And I'm sure he has plenty of business cards and information. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> And I'm the owner of Quality Moving Services um, here in the Richmond surrounding areas, along with the self-storage facility in Petersburg, Virginia. Another location in Chester, and uh, we're opening up an office uh, this month in Norfolk, Virginia as well. Music has always played a role in our family as well. It remains in our blood, but always brought us comfort and recognition. Each of my sisters and brothers, along with me, were taught to sing and play musical instruments. My youngest sister, Brenda, resides in Baltimore, Maryland, and is currently a classical singer and performs internationally. She's also a retired school teacher. Our oldest sister, Carol, became a registered nurse after attending Dixie Hospital Nursing School in Hampton. Carol also played the piano in uh, several churches and choirs. Sister Diane, further her education and clerical skills, and worked as a secretary and part-time school crossing guard. 
Brother William joined the U.S. Army and served one tour before he joined the New York Police Department and the, uh, became a U.S. Army Reservist. We are extremely proud of our parents leading the way and especially how they pressed through against some, so many odds. <clears throat> our mother and father moved to New York, New York City after they got married to further their education. Mother completed a course in cosmetology and daddy became a beggar before returning back to uh, Virginia and later becoming an entrepreneur himself. Okay. I'm sorry. But he's doing a pretty good job. I just emphasize this. As we continue to research each study and track each link, we found a connection in the DNA test results to come. The original African Heritage Study Bible, it presents an in depth study on Ghana, the people, its origin, culture, and religion. The information is accredited and well documented. It refutes many lies that have been told for centuries about African people. Lies such as Africans were illiterate, heathens, lazy, and barbarian. This evil characterization of Africans has created distrust, hate, and great civil unrest for 400 years. We need to go back to when Christ was born and pull out the truth to the scriptures, such as his hair was like wool and his feet were like brass, and bring the truth forward. Then we will begin to see some of the many contributions African people have made in the development of America. Once the truth is told, it will create a significant change in the attitudes and opinions of many people. It will alter the direction this country is headed and it will mend the hearts of many. We were always taught and believed that the truth will make you free. It will also please God because He instructed us to worship Him in spirit and in truth. I often wonder what is so noteworthy about the narrative. The first African American child born and baptized in America with no connections to any contribution. Why has it stood out for all these 400 years? Every time I talk about it, my eyes tear. And I cannot find words to explain the feeling. Also, I have many sleepless nights I cannot explain. However, for these reasons, I will remain vigilant and determined to stay the course and feel what we find. Now, these things we can see is happening right now. The truth is definitely coming close, close to time. But this is the stumbling block. During the early 17th century, this is a pretty small time. In the early 17th century, most of the masters made no distinction in how they treated the Africans from the indentured English servants. Many of the servants were given freedom, and after three or four or seven years, and this gave them the opportunity to own and start their farms. After about two decades, some of these Africans were prospering landowners. Some married English and some married Indians. Those, these mixed offsprings, several generations later, were claimed to be Portuguese or Indians or anything but African. In 1676, Nathaniel Bacon, an African organizing the both of mostly small farmers against the royal government for the way they had been mistreated. The group was mostly black. When the insurrection was put down, about 20 blacks were hanged. This was the beginning of the all out force to separate the races and declare full slavery for the Africans. The coast became more brutal. Most of the Africans fell in the This part right here has been a serious part in, in this presentation for me. Because I'm telling God's truth. Every time I talk about tears. So then I went did a little bit more for say, <coughs> and found some of the codes that they put black Africans under to live on. You know, you need some of them. Which year was that? 1639. Thank you. 1639. No Negro men to bear arms. Also, free black men, black women were tolerable. They had paid tithes. English running away with Negroes. 
I mean, this went on and on and on. Interracial relations restricted. Negro women's children to serve according to the condition of the mother. I mean, it's, it's a shameful God. This stuff was embedded, and we had to exist under that. We, we, we'll share more of that with you. But it's just, I, I can't help it. It just comes <coughs> over me. So I'm still searching. But anyway, we, we were always taught the value of family relationships. We were taught blood is thicker than water, and we were given instructions to never do anything that would bring shame to the family. We took the story, we believe it's an American story, and should be recognized when celebrating American history. The city of Hampton has begun and presented a proclamation on April 20, 2013 as Tucker's 1624 Society. One, one more question. Yes, sir. Uh, can we determine the cultural or archaeological uh, background that generated that kind of edict or that kind of law of separation? You know where that came from? No, I'll give this. <coughs> the only thing we know at this point is that this was before the British government had given up. It lost, you know, 1776 when the American being free from, separated from Great Britain. Right. <coughs> before then, a lot of things were organized to different people coming in this country. A lot of Irelands came here. Yes. Like our name, Tucker is our Ireland name. Right. Jones could be another place somewhere. And but you had the white people in charge of distributing land, making laws and rules. But as we went along, a lot of rules changed. I worried them out. And remember, he had these colonists. So it's not like he is now where he goes to oversee the government. He had colonists, things were run by the colonists. But we, we have not found a lot of the information we need to know because a lot of stuff was burned down. But I'm still searching. But to answer your question, is how, how was it developed? Yes, how, how did we get to? such a, a demoralizing state of affairs, uh, you know, because when I look at the Jewish uh, uh, culture and their enslavement, uh, it's different. right, it's different. It, it's, it's more humane and uh, it, rep it, it recognizes the family in, in terms of... Cult. Yeah. It's all about religion. Right, it's more about religion and, uh, yeah, it was more humane. Right. But the American brand of slavery interaction was economic. Less right, was, yes, totally economic driven, and very, very much less humane. Yes. Well, <coughs> you had poor whites and poor blacks coming in, poor whites and Africans coming in, and the whites felt that they, they wanted better recognition because they saw how the blacks were coming in masses. And that's why the separation came, like I said, back then. After a little scrim, a fight, 1676, in 1676, Nathaniel Bacon and African organized a revolt of most of the small farms against the royal government for the way they had been mistreated. This group was mostly black. When the insurrection was put down, about 20 blacks were hanged. This was the beginning of the all-out force to separate the races and declare full slavery for the Africans. The codes became more brutal. And that's where the codes became more brutal. There was no set law to, to, to do it. It just happened. Did that make it look clear? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Because we've got, it's just like land grants. The J State University is a land grant club. British government gave that land to for for Virginia State University. Well, we find out that a lot of things were given to us, but it was taken back. Yes. For instance, my my problem was trying to find how could we have been free 
on land and then hit the bad day. Yeah. In the cemetery, we paid a hundred dollars for it. When there was a black boat, nothing but black folks buried in there. And the man, Mr. Alkin, used to own it. I want to know how did he, how did he get done with it. So there's still a lot of questions out here, mm -hmm. but we're searching. But that's basically, but the codes are, were extremely crucial. But another thing I wanted to pull out was the DNA test that was done. I'm about to have a copy of it right here. And it shows you how the testing was done. And the Y chromosome is the deciding factor of what denomination you wear, whether you're black or white. You have this information right here. And maybe I share more with you. So I'll turn it back on you since I botched it. Up. <laughs> yeah, good job. <laughs> yes, he did. Yeah. Well, we have another presenter here that I certainly, you know, want to um, make room for that young lady there. Um, but we want to thank you for your time and, and just allowed us a few, few a few moments to share with you. And if you have any questions. Um, and call him. <laughs> <laughs> I got a business to run. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, you talk and I'll take it for a few minutes. I recognize the name Isabella yeah. and that Queen Isabella was the one in Portugal, Portuguese queen, that sent uh, Columbus, Christopher Columbus over here to uh, expand Come their territory. I have to, I've known a few things there along the way, and especially uh, the new news and the peninsula background that you have there. We probably know uh, quite a few of the same people who, uh, who were there about that time. I think, did you finish Huntington in 56? Yes, I did. Okay. All right, I had several relatives there. I attended church on uh, 18th and Madison, yeah. around the corner from the House of Prayer. Yeah, yeah okay. And uh, uh, Earl Faison, I think, yeah, might have been in your class. Yeah, oh my huh? goodness. He went out of California. Right, yeah, played for the San Diego Chargers and, and uh, Lonnie yeah. Humphreys. He was a basketball player. Right, right, yeah. These were guys that I knew. I went to Carver at that time. But finished at Phoenix, <coughs> so uh, uh, I fell in love with young lady at Phoenix. Oh, you couldn't help it. Well, I fell in love with her. She didn't want me. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna ask no, for any sorry. names. No stories. No stories. Oh, but <laughs> I had a cousin that finished uh, Huntington. He did a uh, slide rule for GE, and it hung in the math uh, department for many years. I don't know whether you remember seeing it or not. Uh, Smith, Smith. name uh, Carl Smith, went to live in uh, Chicago. I knew everybody there. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. right. Yeah. So I used to work with, when I was coming up, I had worked with trucks for father. <coughs> he sold vegetables, it was all over the news. And he used to work in the white folks section, went through fad. Sad when black folks got paid. Right. He went, oh, okay. I'm telling the truth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, took that in, he cut the prices. Yeah. So it was clean up day. Mm. He wanted nothing left over because money was starting fresh. So a lot because during that time, a lot of black families, big families. And you knew Waldo Scott? Sure, Dr. Scott. Yes. <laughs> uh, he was the most noted surgeon. It's Bobby Scott's father. Mm -hmm. Absolutely right. A uh, representative. My mother's doctor. Uh-huh. And the, um, the whites would send, would have, call for him for delicate uh, surgeries, and they would usher him in the back door of the hospital. Now tell me what that delicate surgery was all about. Abortion. Okay. I, I tell didn't the know truth. That. I didn't know that. <laughs> but. Well, what happened there? There's a lot of people don't know about it. There's one doctor, one guy, very famous for performing abortion. There's no white women. 
and this went on for many, many years. But he, this guy that created Base Cadillac, Pure Coast, all that, because he was making the big money. Performing abortions. Mm -hmm. Chief police didn't, didn't touch him. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Black man performing abortions on white women. So that's some history that we don't need to know. <laughs> <laughs> it's recorded now. <laughs> uh, Bobby Scott, that you were speaking of, he's he's sitting uh, on stage. Okay. I think at the top picture. Right. But, uh, that was the day that uh, they shared uh, a lot of history uh, at that particular event. And and this this is the proclamation that the city of Hampton. Um, gave us last year. Thank you. Hmm? 2013. 2013. Well, I guess um, I thought, you know, my memory was very good, but obviously I need to <laughs> brush up on a few things. Mm -hmm. But uh, we're, we're going to step to the side because we... Can I get a picture of y'all together? Yes. Did you bring the checkbook? <laughs> <laughs> no checkbook. You know, we got a new museum coming. <laughs> You gotta excuse me for being late and for my attire. You wanna get the three of us? Yeah. You wanna come on the outside around? Okay. Let's scoot over. Don't break the camera. Oh stop. Y'all look good to me. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Alright, y'all ready? Here we go. <laughs> but anytime y'all got some questions you want to ask me, or anytime you want to contact me, please contact me. I have a question. That book um, that was laying on the table, uh, what was it? No, no. The, that one. This one here? Yeah. Black America. Where did you say? You told me where you got it. Barnes and Noble. Barnes, oh, okay. And this Bible, I always go back to my roots, South Carolina. Okay. Right. That Brother Tucker is always amazing, man. I hear the brilliance from you because we had many exchanges out there on 9th Street. Yes, we did. So you left two years after I left, 2009. I said, it's time to say goodbye. And ironically, this daughter of mine sent me a text one day last week telling me about Alexander Tucker to do a presentation on genealogy at the Black History Museum. And she said, do you know him? I, I Google it. I said, no, I don't know that guy. <laughs> Walking here today, and who do I see? But you. Isn't that amazing? Small yes. yes, indeed. <laughs> I'm very appreciative to be here. Good thing I didn't do too many bad things. Oh, nothing. Nothing bad. <laughs> nothing just bringing sound Nothing around. recorded. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah. Well, it's a pleasure to see you all. It is. Thank you. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you.